Welcome everybody. You are now in the awkward moments while we try and figure out if the stream is actually up. Um, so I am waiting to see my head pop up on my YouTube window, which I think is going to happen pretty soon. Um, and once we do that, then we'll get started for real. Okay, um, that's great. Now I just saw myself on delay. I'm thoroughly disoriented um, and um, now I'm ready to uh, kick this event off. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, I see we've got uh, about two dozen people here now. I think that more folks are gonna start streaming in in a bit, um, but really excited to be hosting this event. Um, this is a book that um, I know I was personally really looking forward to coming out. I know, you know, as a, as a collective, Red Emma's was really excited to, to, to have this be available. And I think everybody, you know, um, who's been paying attention to anything important in the city uh, is likewise really thrilled that the Black Butterfly is now out. Um, so uh, we have, um, at Red Emma's have been, uh, you know, kind of uh, in a little bit of a holding pattern. Um, as you may have noticed, there's been a, you know, a deadly pandemic that's made in-person gathering um, quite dangerous. Um, and we've been really erring on the side of protecting our workers and protecting the communities that use our space. So we've been uh, operating with limited hours. Um, and actually for the past month, we've kind of took a little bit of a break to kind of just gather our forces and and reflect strategically about where we're going. Um, I will say we are gonna be reopening for, uh, for takeout and that's takeout for both food and same day pickup of, of books this Thursday, uh, February 4th. Um, we're also doing limited book events um, online. Um, you know, there's been a lot of great books that have come out over the past year. Um, I hope we'll get do-overs on a lot of the book events that we'd love to host for those things. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we're making sure that when there are really incredible authors um, who uh, you know, have a connection to Baltimore, uh, like Lawrence does, that we're able to be here to provide a platform, even if we can't gather in person the way we would want to, and you know, share a meal, share a toast, you know, do book signings after a great talk, like all the things that really make our project something that we actually, um, you know, really find valuable. Um, we're still gonna do them on Zoom. So um, we're doing this one today, um, but I also wanna let you know about February 11th at 7 p.m. We're gonna be hosting a virtual book launch for Shea McCoy's West Baltimore Ruins, um, a really um, beautiful book of photography of Baltimore uh, kind of architecture in disarray and decay. Um, and that's going to be in, in conversation with Terry Henderson of Be More Art. So that's going to be really awesome as well. Um, today, though, we've got um, Lawrence Brown and Nicole Fabricant in conversation talking about Lawrence's new book, The Black Butterfly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them or the book because uh, I want to let uh, Nikki do that. But I will say that both of them are scholars who really know that the best way to do scholarship is to make a lot of trouble uh, with the things that you write and the things that you teach. Um, and trouble in the best possible way, which is to feed um, the, the needs of on the ground organizing to deal with this deeply unequal city. So um, this book, The Black Butterfly, um, it's I think a really essential contribution to our understanding of Baltimore. Um, and I think what I find particularly valuable about it is right there in the title. Um, this isn't just a book about pathology. This isn't just a book about uh, you know, historical injustice and the deep impacts of segregation, of, of dispossession, of discrimination, of bias, all of that's in there. Um, but it's also a book that foregrounds agency, foregrounds hope, foregrounds possibility, right? Um, this isn't just about, you know, redlining, say, right? This is about what happens when um, the neighborhoods that have been harmed by really centuries of, uh, you know, of racialized violence um, are actually given the resources they need to thrive. Um, so for me, that's really, really essential. I think this is a, a really deeply hopeful book and one that I think a lot of people can use in a very practical way um, to orient the things that they're trying to do in this city. So with that, um, I think we've 
got enough people tuned in, um, I can stop running my mouth and I'm going to turn it over to Nikki to kick this off for real. Thanks so much, John. Oh, I really one last thing. Yeah. Um, we are taking, sorry, I forgot one, the one most important thing I was supposed to say, which is that we're doing Q and A in the YouTube chat. Um, so I'll be bringing those into the conversation. So please feel free to at any time post stuff in there. Um, and I will bring that stuff into the conversation. Um, and also if you're, you know, in front of a keyboard, please uh, join me in a kind of just congratulating Lawrence on his book with some virtual applause. <laughs> Thanks so much, John. Um, and thanks to Red Emma's for hosting this. We would all love to be in person celebrating the release of Lawrence's book. Uh, but as John mentioned, uh, that's just not possible. But Red Emma's has been a hub for a lot of us for conversation, political organizing, intellectual thought, um, and a real model for what co-ops could look like in a city like Baltimore, right? So thanks, John. I'm thrilled to be here with you all today discussing Lawrence's book, The Black Butterfly, The Harmful Politics of Race and Space in, in America. Um, and it came out, it was released last Tuesday by Johns Hopkins Press. Very exciting moment for Lawrence. Um, and I just wanted to briefly introduce Lawrence as my colleague, dear friend and comrade in struggle. Um, this is a real testament to my 10 years knowing Lawrence and to being on the ground uh, with movements. So Lawrence is trained as a public health scholar, but I always describe him as one of these Renaissance scholars. I really think he is a historian, an archivist, an urban planner, a critical geographer, a political economist, and so much more critical race theorist um, who sees health in an incredibly holistic way from a interdisciplinary perspective, but also from a community health perspective. So in many respects, the book is Lawrence Brown and his uh, commitment to healing Black communities in Baltimore in a hyper segregated um, city. I've known Lawrence for a very long time. Uh, we've been part of a lot of political and intellectual conversations tied to the Baltimore School of Thought. Um, I've co-taught with Lawrence We've been down together in Curtis Bay, where we've merged anthropology and public health courses. And I've heard him teach alongside community activists and organizers. Uh, we've composted together and produced black gold in the Wakanda of South Baltimore, as Mr. Marvin from the Baltimore Compost Collective would refer to it. And we've also farmed together. More recently, both got in bags of spinach after harvesting spinach on the urban farm in Cherry Hill, which is a part of Black Yield, a very important um, organization fighting for Black land reclamation and food sovereignty in Cherry Hill. And um, I just wanted to uplift some of these groups, but I've always respected Lawrence's deep sensitivity, his sharp intellect and his commitment to movement organizing, which is rare in the academy. It's very rare that you see people bridging holistically the world of organizing and the world of teaching. And I think Lawrence does that majestically. Um, he has a real political commitment to building the kind of just sustainable world that we all want to live in. So for Lawrence, classrooms become laboratories of thought and of action. And I think in the same way, this book is an incredible toolkit. It's a toolkit for organizers, for public school teachers and the like. And we're seeing that already with his uh, Black Butterfly Academy and thinking about interactive websites and ways in which high school teachers will take this, will teach it and students can be lit up around some of this history and then begin to envision the kinds of changes they wanna see in the Black butterfly. So without further ado, I want to pose a few questions to Lawrence and kind of engage in more of a dialogue about his book. And the first is about the vision for the book. How and in what ways did this book come out of a long-term political commitment? What did some of those commitments look like in Baltimore? I know you've been here for a decade uh, doing some of this work on the ground. So could you share with folks how this book came to fruition? Sure. First of all, I just want to say thank you, Red Emma's, for hosting this wonderful conversation with my dear friend. One reason I actually wanted Nikki Fabricant to be the person questioning and posing these questions is because she actually, I, I let her have a draft of my rough finished copy um, 
a year or so, a year and a half ago. And uh, so I knew she was one of the very few people who had really read the whole thing and wrestled with it and taught it uh, to her students. And so I, I, I know I'm thrilled that to be able to engage in conversation with someone who has sort of been a thought partner um, in this work with me. Um, so thank you, Red Emma's. Thank you, Nikki, for agreeing to have this conversation. And thank all of you for coming out during this lunch hour conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess in terms of like the political roots of the book, I think I would say that, you know, in many ways, uh, there's the long sort of roots, which sort of, you know, begin, you know, uh, I think with the Black freedom struggle, you know, the, the history that I discuss in the book, um, all of that, uh, the struggle to survive, the, the will to uh, thrive and try to make a way out of no way, like that is, you know, the impetus for the book. Um, it's really a Sankofa project, is, which is a African, a, a West African word for looking back in order to move forward. Um, and that's, I think, what John was referencing. Like, I'm not just looking back. I'm also looking back so that we can figure out, well, where do we need to go? Where do we need to move into the future? And I think it's important to, to say that my book, the, the unit of analysis is Black neighborhoods. Like, that is what I'm analyzing, thinking about, and then projecting a possible thriving future for. So I think uh, just, you know, the long history of the Black freedom struggle in America, uh, being on this soil for over 400 years. And then I think arriving in Baltimore in 2010, uh, by 2011, I was working with people in East Baltimore, being introduced to EBDI, and Middle East Baltimore, where that was being uprooted, had been uprooted by Johns Hopkins University. And looking at these empty blocks, a few people were able to remain. So they were able to tell the story, Donald Gresham, uh, Lisa Francis, uh, Sally Gorham, Lucille Gorham, who I met out in Bel Air Edison where she had been uprooted before she passed in 2012. And just meeting all of these incredible people and these stories and hearing, you know, how EBDI, uh, East Baltimore Development Co Incorporated uh, had had this like really devastating impact on black people's lives and how that neighborhood was really torn apart. And I think when I was a college student at Morehouse in Atlanta, I saw a public housing community in the third and final phase of Hope Six. It was uh, a Clinton policy to demolish about a quarter million units of public housing across the country. And, you know, so I saw like the last few people who were getting ready to be put out of Harris Homes, a public housing community across the street from Morehouse College. And, you know, that was like my freshman, sophomore year. And I just became very um, interested engaged in struggles against forced displacement. So when I got here to Baltimore, forced displacement was this issue I was looking at once again. And I think that really, I took a deep dive into under trying to understand like what happened, what's going on, what's the impact of repeatedly uprooting black people in black neighborhoods. And so, you know, then the uprising, uh, you know, took place in on April 27th, 2015, which in and of itself was really sparked some say with Oscar Grant and out in uh, San Francisco and uh, the Bay Area. And then also uh, Mike Brown, his killing uh, in Ferguson the year before and those non-indictments of police officers by the end of 2014. And we were marching in the streets, you know, up and down St. Paul and Calvert and, and saying Black Lives Matter. And, uh, and just those, that the uprising then, which followed that movement, or it was a really a part of it in many ways, uh, you know, it really turned my life upside down. And I think it just, it threw my scholarship, it focused it, you know, very strongly on looking at urban uprisings, historical trauma, and, um, I think by 2017 or 20, well, later in 2015, I was looking at a racial dot map and I saw this pattern of a black butterfly where black populations live in Baltimore. And I think that was really sort of the genesis of this book uh, when my editors saw that that was really taking off 
and we had a conversation to, um, you know, about writing and, and publishing this book. I think that's really the chronology of how it all really took place. Mm. So the black butterfly has become very much a part of our popular public imaginary. It's been graffitied on buildings right across the city of Baltimore. Um, I use many of your maps, your incredible maps, which is part of your uh, urban planning and urban history degree. Um, but I just wanted to ask you about the public nature of this book or think about, I know your commitments to popular education, to spaces and to circles where organizers and folks from the Black Butterfly can contribute to intellectual production. How do you see this book? Um, it's written in an incredibly accessible with definitions at the very beginning to localize, to spatialize, and to force us to understand how you're conceptualizing. So share with everyone um, <clears throat> how and in what ways you would like to see this book and discussions about it in the hands of lots of folks in school systems in the Black Butterfly. Yeah, I mean, I, you mentioned the art, and I think that's the first place to, place to start because, you know, graffiti artists like Nether and uh, Chris Wilson uh, painted a Black Butterfly. And, um, you know, a hip hop artist named San Zulu created a song named Black Butterfly. Um, folks at the Baltimore Center Stage uh, had a Butterfly series. So artists really uh, pushed the concept uh, Nether, he put on <laughs> top of a building alongside I-83, the L and the butterfly and these big white letters on this red brick building and you couldn't miss it. Like you drive by I-83 and it's like, which is mind blowing. And I think when I saw that, I was like, all right, this is, it's really going somewhere. Like people are taking it and running with it. And that's, I was really excited about that. So I think, you know, the artists are pivotal to making it something that a lot of people understand and, and can grab onto. Um, and so I've just been really thrilled about that. Um, and I guess, you know, it's just in terms of, I tried to, I definitely wanted it to be accessible, but have scholarly rigor. Um, and I'm thinking about those definitions at the beginning of the book. I was, there's a great book by a scholar named Eve Ewing, uh, Ghost in the Schoolyard, um, about school closings in, in Chicago. And I was, it was the only book I read from front to end while I was writing, because it's just hard to read while I'm trying to write my own book, uh, read fully. And so I, but I read her book and it was a model of like accessible language. It was a model of like, she put those definitions at the front of her book. And I was like, aha, this is, you know, definitely an example of how you can set the stage and provide clarity so that you can get folks like on the same page metaphorically. And so I think that was the inspiration, you know, I had inspirations like, uh, you know, thinking about artists who were making it accessible, thinking about Eve Ewing and her book and how, you know, she set the stage and then wrote in like this beautifully accessible language. And I think, you know, the third influence is, you know, being Southern from the deep South, you know, our whole cultural context in many ways is around making it plain you know, Fannie Lou Hamer and, and her terrific organizing, you know, you, you always understood exactly what she was saying because she wasn't trying to impress you with any verbose, you know, uh, articulation. She was going to just tell it like it is. And so I think that um, all of that was, you know, it's just a part of who I am and part of what I was seeing. And so hopefully that does make it something that people can relate to but still hopefully have enough teeth where you can go to a footnote. You know, the footnotes, by the way, y'all, there's a lot of tea is in the footnotes, so don't sleep. That's why I put it like, you could be sipping on hot tea if you can get to the footnotes and see what I was really, when I dig in a little deeper. But yeah, I think that's the, uh, that was the plan and that's a part of who I am. And so hopefully it resonates. I'm going to push you a little harder on that question because I know you very well and we've done popular education together all over the city and have thought about 
And a lot of this has come out of your innovation, how to teach redlining using Lego gamification. Mm. It inspired kids at Benjamin Franklin High School down in South Baltimore in ways that traditional texts just haven't. So what are the ways in which you see the black butterfly coming to life in a public or popular educational realm? Like how would, what kinds of tools would you use to teach about these interlocking systems of oppression? Yeah, I mean, and that is a great question. I, you know, you and I know we thought about and, you know, really, I, I remember coming to your class and doing a class exercise because I like, um, we were talking about the residential security map, which mm -hmm. has four colors, red, blue, yellow, and green. And really getting people to have this, the students and other people I've done this exercise with to, to live and assimilate putting themselves into these four categories so they could get just a sense of what racial segregation and then the what I call the weaponization of racial segregation, segronomics, to get a sense of how being relegated to different categories, especially if you're living in yellow line or red line communities, um, would then have an impact on the trajectory of your life. And so I think, um, simulations, gamification, um, activities. You know, I'm thinking I've created a discussion guide for book clubs, you know, have a website with uh, some digital archival material that people can use. So I was just thinking about, um, you know, for different age groups, for different types of learners, for different people who may not even, you know, crack the cover of the book, are there other ways we can get this information out? Mm -hmm. and I think that's been a question that uh, academicians and professors like us, we've thought a lot about like, how do we make sure that this is not just aimed at a higher education audience. We wanna make sure that the babies in seventh grade that they mm -hmm. can get this. And so that's, that's where I think the popular education approach and I think the ethos is really you know coming into play. So I'm always thinking about you know what games can I create or what you know exercise can I you know lead that helps people really get a sense of what we're talking about. That's great. I mean, I've thought a lot about the physicality too, right? Like how you learn through doing together, how collective work, how farming, how building a community land trust, right, becomes a space in which youth can learn. So I'm excited to continue thinking with you about some of these things. Um, but I want to get us to how you define Baltimore apartheid in the book. There might be folks that are listening to this that have not heard that term before. Why do you choose the term Baltimore apartheid? And one thing I absolutely love about this book, and it's why I'll teach it over and over again, is it's rare you get um, to understand interlocking systems of oppression. So from the criminal justice system to education, to practices, policies, budgets, as you say, right? That we are so deeply entrenched in systems of oppression. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about how Baltimore apartheid is part of a long history of these interlocking systems. Sure. Well, you know, in the book, I really define Baltimore apartheid as, of course, something that's rooted in American apartheid. So it's important to um, state that American apartheid was already a concept that was being used. Uh, Nancy Ditton and uh, Douglas Massey, they co-wrote a book called American Apartheid, I believe back in the 90s. Um, you had Mindy Fully Love, Mindy Thompson Fully Love, uh, and her uh, co-authors, they wrote like a a paper called The Ghetto Game, looking at the way development is really like a shell game. And so she was talking about, well, corporate development. And so she was talking about, she defined in that paper, American apartheid as both racial segregation and forced displacement. So concentrating people and clearing people out. Um, so American apartheid. And then with Baltimore apartheid, there was a scholar at the University of Maryland, Garrett Power, uh, who wrote a just amazing paper called Apartheid Baltimore Style. Um, and it, he details in that paper how Baltimore was the first city to pass a residential racial zoning ordinance in December 1910. Um, so last December was the 110th commemoration of that ordinance. 
Um, and so, you know, that language already existed in, in a, a different formulation. So apartheid Baltimore style, I was like, well, I'm just gonna create this, you know, phrase Baltimore apartheid based on this existing scholarship, but really use that phrase in a way to be very direct in talking about, again, both racial segregation and forced displacement, that both are happening at the same time, concentrating people, uprooting and clearing people out. Um, and that's really, I think, trying to uh, focus people on the ways in which race and space are manipulated and exploited uh, historically by white Baltimoreans uh, and now maintained even by a black political class. Wonderful. Um, so I'm wondering if you can expand upon a little bit this idea, you know, within public health, um, I just wanna push you again a little bit further around the interlocking systems of oppression and think about the ways in which this beats down on bodies, right? Like physical bodies. Um, I know that you were trained in a public health, but you are so not steeped in the traditional epidemiological <laughs> sense, right? As we work with lots of public health folks, there is a kind of deterministic health model that's used. So how and in what ways do you see minds, physical bodies uh, beaten down by some of the interlocking systems of oppression in Baltimore? Yeah, I think, you know, it all boils down to a simple ecological truth, mm -hmm. which is really the thesis of my book that you cannot make black lives matter if you don't make black neighborhoods matter. And that's the public health challenge as well, that you can't have, you can't make black health matter when black neighborhoods are polluted, mm -hmm. when they're inflicted with toxic lead exposure, which poison the minds of black babies mm -hmm. and black toddlers and black infants and then when they go to school, their brains, the cognitive capacity has been diminished. Then you have uh, either folks dropping out or not being able to move on up into either the trades or a collegiate experience to get that um, credentialing that you can move up economically. Um, so then you have that, you know, more likely folks are gonna be to end up incarcerated. So a lot of people talk about, you know, the school to prison pipeline, but I say, in fact, it's really a toxic lead exposure to school to prison pipeline. Um, you know, you can't have health when there's so much violence, both at the hands of community members and at the hands of police that also inflicts trauma psychologically on the brain, uh, not to mention, you know, the physical health issues that also are going to be a result. Um, when you live in communities impacted by food apartheid, uh, when you have uh, transit apartheid and people can't get the jobs and what that's going to mean most in America, we know our health insurance, private health insurance is attached to your job. So, you know, if you don't have a job, you know, we'll have the best insurance and we have a two tiered health insurance system. So now you go and you, when you try to access care, you know, you're, you're in the bottom tier of Medicaid uh, particularly, uh, and in some places, Medicare is going to be on the bottom rung too. Uh, so, I mean, health is going to be impacted in so many ways when you look at how space is combined with race to make Black neighborhoods not matter, which means that as a result, Black health won't matter um, as well. So, and there are many other issues. Um, as it relates to health, but I think that's just, you know, this fundamental truth that whatever issue you're looking at, chronic diseases, infectious diseases like COVID. Um, and by the way, y'all, COVID jumped off in America in hypersegregated cities. New York, category four hypersegregated cities, Chicago, category five, Detroit, category five, Milwaukee, category five, hypersegregated cities. So uh, back in March and April of last year, uh, and it hit Native American reservations, particularly Navajo County um, and Apache County in Arizona, McKinley County, I believe it is called uh, in uh, New Mexico, so, and border counties uh, down at the border. 
So these spaces and places that have been marginalized and demonized, the spatial impact of historical trauma on those communities, it makes the people that live there more vulnerable than to uh, negative health conditions. And so that's the thing that I tried to illuminate. I focused on black neighborhoods, but the concept really applies even if you uh, expand um, your scope outside of just African-American communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know we're gonna soon open this up to dialogue with the audience, but I do wanna quickly make sure that we get to your solutions. I know, okay, we have about five minutes, thanks John, because we've got to get to solutions. Part of what I absolutely adore about you as a colleague and a friend and, a, and an interlocutor is that it's not enough to write an academic book. It's gotta be accessible. It's gotta be in the hands of youth from our city that live in these communities communities, but it's also where do we go? Most academics are not very good at mapping out a path for us. It's a lot of critique, a lot of cynicism, and a lot of demobilization within the academy. Um, tell us, Dr. Lawrence Brown, how do we map out a future for an equitable Baltimore? And there's a lot. So I'm definitely not going to get to it all in five all minutes. It. So I'm going to lift up, I think, the three that I just want to talk about today. So the first being Black neighborhood reparations, uh, which is taking 10% of the city budget, allocating that to the top 20 or so red line Black communities and establishing, establishing democratically elected neighborhood equity councils or uh, racial equity councils who can help decide in concert with communities how that money gets spent. And you do that for 40 or 50 years or more. Because like I said, we've been in the mess of Baltimore apartheid for 110 years. It might take that long, I don't know. But at least 40 or 50 years to get these communities the resources that they need. Number two, I have a three, I suggest a $3 billion racial equity social impact bond to really kickstart the entire process in concert with those neighborhood reparations. Uh, half of that is really getting toxic lead out of the community. And then the other 1.5 billion is really around addressing food apartheid, transit apartheid, funding like 30 more sites of safe streets. We lost the dear brother who was leading that, Dante Barstow, may he rest in peace. Uh, so we're gonna have to, but we need to ramp up violence prevention. Um, you know, 500 million is, is for housing first, for people who are experiencing homelessness. So, you know, $3 billion to really kickstart that and then Baltimore neighborhood reparations to really keep it going. And then I think the third and final thing I'll say right now is just, you know, thinking about the moment that we're in, I talk about how we need to dismantle and close down the Baltimore Police Department and at, at midnight. And what you do is, or 11.59 p.m. and then 12 o'clock, what you do is you maybe have officers that you can retain and officers you, you bring in and you start a Baltimore peace building authority because we got to move away from policing to peace building. And so I, I think I like what you said. I tried not to just say, here's what's wrong. I wanted to say, here's how okay. we could actually move forward in a way that's going to bring make racial equity a reality. Mm -hmm. So we know that none of this is possible without incredible pressure from the grassroots and movement building. Um, so I guess I just wanted to end here with our part by thinking about how you see the value of the black butterfly in building coalitions or movements that will pressure a Scott administration to actually move forward, right? What might that look like? Um, we both have been part of um, political education. Some of the important movements and schools of thought you talk about happen in schools outside of the right formal academy or even school system. So how do we use the book for movement building and how do we pressure a Scott administration to move forward? Well, the biggest thing is I think the book hopefully functions as a text for political education because I, my part of my hope was, can I write something that helps make organizers smarter and sharper so that organizers and activists they know budgets, they know they can talk policy in a sharp way that your city council member, your mayor, 
and the department and agency heads that they can't duck and dodge. They're going to have to deal with people who know what they're talking about. And then we have to support those who are pushing for the changes that we need. And we need to vote the ones out that don't um, and so and, and raise hell in the process. So I think that's really the bl blueprint. Great. So I think at this point, we were only given five minutes. So it's time to open this up to the audience questions. Um, and hopefully someone will be feeding some of those questions. Yeah, so I would say go ahead um, and put your questions in the YouTube chat and we'll bring them in here. Um, I will say we had one question already from Mr. The Bigger One. Oh, actually, no, sorry, from Dan Henson. Uh, any advice to developers who are trying to build equity in Baltimore? Well, I like to distinguish between like corporate developers who I think um, have utilize tax policies in a very destructive way. TIFs, pilots, tax breaks. Um, TIFs, tax increment financing, pilots, payments in lieu of taxes. Um, both of those essentially are tax diversionary tactics that send your tax dollars to pay off the bondholders in the TIF um, or allow private entities like universities and hospitals to not pay their full assessment on taxes. So in both instances, that money don't, does not go into the general fund. Now, what does that mean? What it means is there's a lot of discussion now about defund the police. And it's like, ooh, it's a big scary thing. By the way, our city council president uh, used a very sort of derogatory language. Uh, he said that uh, council president uh, Nick Mosby, he said that it was like uh, people were emotional, uh, there, and which is derogatory in terms of you're using language uh, that usually has stigmatized women in our society uh, as if uh, defund the police could not be a rational, logical, evidence-based argument. Uh, so he was deriding the people who, who used the slogan as, as emotional. Um, what, what, you, what happens with that dynamic, uh, or the reason why I bring that up is because when they don't pay their taxes, they are, those entities are defunding black neighborhoods. They are defunding public schools. They are defunding public health. They are defunding public rec centers. So when we say defund the police, we're saying stop defunding us. We've been defunded the whole time. And that's the dynamic that I think um, it kind of goes back to Nikki's question, but I think if we're talking about corporate developers, mm -hmm. we need to, they need to take a look at how they have been playing a role at defunding black neighborhoods. Mm. And I think that's, so, you know, Beatty development, you got uh, Sagamore, these big developers that I think, uh, again, play a huge role. Now with Sagamore, we, we organized in 2016, year after the uprising. And we said, look, we think there can be a win, win, win. A, don't, don't segregate this community in the corner of the White L. So bring in 10, 20% of inclusionary housing. That, that would be four, five, six, 700 black families who can come and live in lead free, uh, green community um, and have a, you know, new infrastructure. Uh, that would be a tremendous boon for them. So inclusionary housing, uh, would have been tremendous, except Baltimore's inclusionary housing policy ain't worth the paper that it's written on because it was written to say, hey, uh, you know, you can get out of this commitment if the city don't have money. And the city never has money mm -hmm. to make that law real. So you might as well throw it out the window and write one that has real teeth. So corporate developers have have to look in the mirror and reckon with the way that they help perpetuate Baltimore apartheid. So mm -hmm. that's on that side. Now, your mom and pop developers, I think are on the other side, black developers, you know, uh, you know, that have less than 10 million in assets, they're still trying to get off the ground. There are some folks, I know them uh, out in West Baltimore. Uh, you got Aspire Homes, Sarsfield Williams, you got Bree Jones, Parody Homes, you got uh, Veronica Owens, uh, Monarch Butterfly Enterprises, 
Uh, you got Smaltimore Homes, Laquita La 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 Chancy. And these are small time black developers that I think, you know, if we're gonna do TIFFs, they are the ones that need to get the resources. Um, TIFFs weren't really meant for your big time corporate developers to come in and uh, create exclusionary communities that don't desegregate our communities. If you're gonna use TIFFs, you make them something that are used for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Include that. Sagamore didn't need $139.8 million in parks, which by the way is like three times the city budget for parks and recs. They didn't need that. That $139 million could have been used on housing. So that's what we're saying. Um, in a, for the mom and pop developers, the black developers who want to make black neighborhoods matter, matter let's allocate resources to those kind of folks. And when we do development, whether corporate or mom and pop, what we want to do is do development without displacement. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I would segment my answer. I think corporate developers have to take much more responsibility, think much more critically about how they can help play a role in dismantling Baltimore apartheid mm -hmm. instead of maintaining it. And then how we need to fund and support and really undergird, I think, the more mom and pop developers and architects and developers and planners who have really wonderful ideas that can really help rejuvenate and turn Baltimore into the Wakanda that it really is and should be. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that you mentioned in the book, Lawrence, I just want to plug because I'm a member of the South Baltimore Land Trust Committee, and you really plug community wealth creation and land trusts, right, as alternatives, as solutions to permanently affordable housing. I would love to see more developers get involved with youth who are envisioning from the ground up what affordable development should look like, what green spaces in their communities can look like. This is happening in West Baltimore and East Baltimore and in South Baltimore. And these are places where instead of coming in and saying this is how development should be done, listen, provide some resources. Yeah, absolutely. I think you raise a good point. A lot of corporate developers, especially their big thing is like housing and commercial. And what you and I know is that, look, you need community gardens, urban farms, violence prevention. You need other things that help, you know, green space. You need other things. Well, not the $139 million green space. We're talking about community owned and, you know, community really driven green space. Artists, you know, murals. We're talking about, you know, community oriented development that's broader than just housing and commercial. Like that has to be, that can't be, Baltimore needs much more than that. And so we've got to think much more critically about these other ways that we can develop, you know, like you said, uh, Black Yield Institute. Uh, we had we did some work with uh, the the other one down in, in uh, Curtis. Oh. Fern, what is the name of? <laughs> Filbert Street Garden. Filbert Street, yeah, Filbert Street. You know, you got Tubman House and uh, the community gardening that Eddie Conway and the Friends Group they do out in West Baltimore, uh, next to the, where Freddie Gray was killed. Um, so I think. You know, you got to look at other ways to make Black neighborhoods matter. Community health workers, um, you know, communities, cooperatives, you know, banks, banks are y'all out there listening. You should be listening. Banks, we need not just lines of credit for entrepreneurs, single entrepreneurs and, a, and a, a two heart partners and that, and that. We need community cooperative lines of capital. That's and so that's developers, if you're wondering what you need to be doing, do that. Get, take, you got 500 million, open up 50 million in credit for cooperatives, for solidarity economics, so that people can rep and create a solidarity cooperative economy. That's what Baltimore needs. Not just a few people getting wealthy, but a community getting wealthy. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I'm gonna uh, peel some things off so we can see if we can squeeze these in. Uh, I wanna make sure we get to this one from Nicole King because I think it's uh, a good one on kind of next steps. Uh, what are some tactics for city neighborhoods to work together to build collective power? Neighborhoods are often pushed to compete rather than collaborate for resources. How do we shift that dynamic? 
Well, the quick way I'll answer that is to say white L neighborhoods have to operate in solidarity with black butterfly neighborhoods, which means white L neighborhoods have to have a reckoning. Mount Washington, Roland Park, Guilford, Homeland, uh, Hamden, Hamden, all these exclusionary white supremacist rooted communities, they're going to have to look in the mirror, have a reckoning. And then how do y'all turn over some of those resources? How do you share power? How do you desegregate? Not just desegregation in terms of, well, we got some black people living with us, but we talking about desegregating resources. And that's the thing I'm gonna talk about housing mobility in a future conversation. It just can't be uh, black people wanting or having to move out to get to opportunity. Black people should be able to stay where they want to live in, in black communities and thrive where they are. So white L neighborhoods, that's what I think the broadly speaking, and there's a lot more in the book, but broadly speaking, I think that's what I would be looking for. Okay. Um, so uh, can you talk a little bit more of this is a question about land ownership uh, uh, or question of ownership in general? How, how does the lack of black ownership uh, play out in uh, the relationship between the uh, black butterfly and the white owl? Um, I mean, in a capitalistic system where land is capital, when you don't have land, you don't have power, you don't have wealth. So when you talk about, and there are black homeowners, um, although we can get into ground rent and some little bit of complications around that in Maryland, but there are black homeowners. The problem is even when black people own land, they're often or housing, they're stuck with these predatory loans, predatory arrangements, subprime mortgages. And so um, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not just having owning, it's can we keep it? And with these predatory subprime arrangements, you can add in cars with this equation too, because you got subprime auto loans, you got subprime auto insurance. So this thing is pervasive, what we're talking about. So the thing that I think we have to look at is in, in this society, if we're talking about owning, we need to talk about equitable ownership, cooperative ownership. And I think that's the direction we need to go. We got to undo and unravel and compensate, repair, reparations. We have to repair the damage from all of the lost capital, lost land, the uprooting of black people out of place and space, that has to be a big part of the dynamic. It's not just land ownership now or ownership now, it's also all of that capital that was taken from us that we lost. And so I think that's the bigger picture that we need to look at. Uh, let's see, so there's a question here about um, spatial de concentration and uh, the Kerner Commission. Um, I don't know if everybody you know, on the stream is familiar with that, um, but it was a recommendation around um, you know, access to opportunity, but also kind of uh, simultaneously perhaps a mode of urban counterinsurgency. Um, and I guess, Lawrence, if you wanna talk a little bit about that, um, you mentioned, you know, this idea that like people have to move to get to, uh, you know, to a better place, right? So it uh, let's focus on the individual rather than um, the the place based community. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, anything that this this question around spatial deconcentration um, and just kind of this long legacy of thinking in terms of displacement as the way you get to an equal society has played out in Baltimore? Yeah, I think the heart of that question, um, if I can drive. <laughs> my car straight to the heart um, is really the question of desegregation. And I think desegregation in America, Nina Simone, the jazz singer, she said uh, desegregation is a joke. Now, why does she say that? She said it's a joke because, uh, and I presume what she was really getting at is desegregation was pretty much black people being next to white people and relying on that as the way that we're going to make America a racially equal and equitable society. In fact, black people can be successful without being next to white people. That's, that's the, so you don't necessarily need that. The problem is when black people are in red line communities, 
they don't have capital. They don't have access. They don't have resources. They don't have opportunity. That's the problem. So the desegregation that's really needed, the deconcentration that's really needed is in the budget. Financial desegregation, that's what's really needed because you can have thriving Black communities, Black Wall Street, Rosewood, Tulsa, Ro uh, well, Rosewood, Greenwood Community in Tulsa, Springfield, Illinois, Sweet Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Haytai, North Car Durham, North Carolina. We have had thriving Black communities. What happened? They were destroyed by white supremacist violence. That's, this is America. That's the story. We in Black History Month, this is America's history. So we've had, so that, those instances are proof that you can have thriving, beautiful Black communities that don't necessarily have white people in and around them. Now, Black people should have a choice to live where they want to live, fair housing, housing mobility. You should have the choice to go live in, ba in Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, in, in the whitest places you can find. We should have the choice to go and, and live with our good white neighbors. We should have that choice. But we should also have the choice to live in thriving, beautiful Black communities. And the problem with our thinking around deconcentration and desegregation is that we only think about this, Black people being next to white people. And we don't give no attention and no thought to making Black neighborhoods matter. And so I think that's what we have to address. All right. Um, so um, I know I have like a ton of questions that I'm going to probably just shoot you over email because they're all like super technical nerdy questions about bonds and housing policies and things. Well, you um, got but I thought questions, read the book. I put it in the book. <laughs> I don't have to fool with a whole lot of questions. You know, I just I took enough bit so y'all read the book. And if you got any questions after the book, then you reach out to me. <laughs> so uh, Nicole, do you have like a last question that you can you want to ask to sort of um, you know uh, set this up to uh, to end on sure. a great note? Um, oh my goodness, I had so many questions. Lawrence knows I know, that's that's a list of 20 <laughs> questions. We weren't gonna fit them all in. But I guess one way, I know there are a lot of folks listening in from anchor institutions across um, Baltimore and it does seem like there is a critical role, right? That anchor institutions have played in the extraction of black history, in the extraction of black wealth, right? Predatory practices, displacements, you spoke of EBDI. Um, so I'd like for you maybe to end with thinking about how we dismantle this structure of anchor institutions. What role, I mean, I think our friend Eric Jackson would say something like, get out of the way, right? Like we don't need y'all here, right? Let's pave a new path from the grassroots forward. But is there a role for institutions, right? In dismantling Baltimore apartheid and how, um, what's the advice, the guidance you would give to faculty, especially young faculty who want to do this kind of activist work? Um, where should they put their energy? Institutions support individualistic productions, right? Not collectivism that we're talking about or movement building. So there's like three questions in one, know, but I'm and, thinking and about the role for the, too, so I know, I mean, there's so much in there, in your book too, that's a yeah. model for how to do this kind of work well. Yeah, I mean, and there is a lot. I think briefly, I'll just say, you know, uh, anchor institutions, the biggest thing is, you know, communities are anchor institutions too. Um, social networks, the social capital that's existing, they're anchor institutions too. So this uprooting, uh, the gentrification policies like live near your work that bring in outside folks at the expense of existing residents, that kind of stuff has to go. Or if you're going to do that, then you need to have a stay where you are voucher that's twice as high as the live near your work subsidy. So I talk about that. If we can't, we got to keep our existing. I'm for development. Development mm -hmm. is great when you do it without displacement and you have the engagement of people who live there. So let me dispel that real quick. But that's one thing anchor institutions could do and should be doing. Um, the other thing is those private institutions pay your taxes, full taxation, stop using, trying to create these weaselly deals uh -huh. with mayors uh, so that you can get a private police force, 
Hopkins, stop doing uh, deals pilots where you got Hopkins and Mercy and Micah where they're paying five cents on the dollar in terms of their taxation. Y'all are defunding black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We need y'all to pay your taxes so we can have the general fund to help make black neighborhoods matter. Um, so activists, that's what you push for. You push the administration, you push um, folks in you know, the president's office, Ron Daniels, if you're at Hopkins, and you really sit down with him and say, look, we need you to understand something. First of all, actually, you probably need to go. We need to get somebody else up in here who's going, because Daniels put EBDI and this whole other thing and put pilots. So you know he isn't what he needs to be. We need new leadership. We need folks that are serious about making repair, um, you know, and reckoning. Hopkins needs to reckon with the history of starting out what as a slave owner, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? Hopkins need to be talking about reparations. I was just going to ask and that question: Should Hopkins be offering? So it's a whole thing that we we need a society that's really, you know, focused on how do we make repair at every institution, and powerful agency really has to reckon with that. Um, so we're, yeah, we're just gonna have to really have a real reckoning, a real wrestling with history. Uh, and I think faculty, I think to your last point, you know, um, it is tough to try to be community engaged and publish and teach and grade, you know, so you got all these obligations, it's really tough. I got burnt out, I got burnt out from all of that um, <laughs> by the end of 2019. So. Yeah, community and community engaged scholarship uh, and ways of thinking about, you know, advancing our careers that don't rely on like this individualistic mm -hmm. model of production. I think that's going to be needed. You know, now you got COVID is virtual teaching. And, you know, I know for scholars like Nikki and I, like this is a crazy situation because we like taking, we like being out and about. <laughs> we like, matter of fact, we went down to Cherry Hill, you right? We still are out and about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this this is tough. This is tough. The academy is tough. You know, the issue with adjuncts, you know, the expectation exploitation of adjuncts. So the academy itself has a lot of... So if you're a chair, if you become a dean, an associate dean, you got to help change this structure. I, I think it's really killing a lot of us. It's killing mm -hmm. a lot, you know, definitely killing the adjuncts. And like I say, I was burned out and I was a tenured faculty uh, by 2019. So we got to redo, revisit, re dismantle, you know, the academy in mm -hmm. so many ways um, and try to figure out a better model. Um, and there are other people who are probably experts on that, but we need to do it. All right. So I think we're going to try and uh, we're going to wrap this up. Um, this is the first event for this book, the first of many conversations that are going to be happening over the coming months. In, you know, through a lot of different uh, communities, a lot of different places. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done um, that this book is an excellent guide for. So if you haven't already purchased it, um, you should do that. Um, if you think this book is the thing you actually need to buy for like, you know, a hundred people who can move some things in the city, like talk to Red Emmis, we'll set up a bulk order. Um, and I want to just thank Nikki for um, some excellent, excellent questions. And I want to thank Lawrence um, for really not just the book, but for everything he's done to really crystallize the, the understanding we need about uh, Baltimore as a deeply unequal city. So um, give him a hand in the chat and uh, we'll keep this going elsewhere. Bye, everybody. Thanks, John.